Luke 24. So we have the recording of the resurrection in all four Gospels. The, uh, I was in Lowe's yesterday evening taking back some junk and uh, they still have Easter lilies. They had two big containers full and uh, they were still like $8 a, a, a flower. But guess what? Uh, there have been times I have bought all their Saturday night specials. I gave them for like 50 cents. They, they over ordered for like 200 of them. I went in just before they closed and made them an offer. Yeah, get them out. So I had a big van full. I just gave Easter lilies out everywhere. <laughs> we uh, have a crop of them that come up around the first on the 10th of June, around that, from here, all these 35 years I've pastored here, we've taken any leftovers and we've planted them in the backyard. And around the uh, 10th of June, this, the following year, they'll start coming up every single year. We have Easter lilies uh, in one, all around that redbud tree. And so I always try to get pictures of them every year. Just so I remember, you know, the Easter lily is a symbol of the resurrection. Yeah. And, uh, but they, I didn't buy any, as you can see. I want to compliment Deborah on the arrangements that she recently made. These are new ones, aren't they? No, they were one I used last year. Okay. I well, aren't they? they still smell just like they're. Yeah, they do. <laughs> but, uh, <It's> amazing. <laughs> anyway, she does professional. She's not, I mean, this is just, she's a crafty person, right? Crafty can mean like Wiley Coyote, you know, but anyway, she's very good at what she does because she, and Lisa, you, you were, you ran Dylan's flower shop for years before you started your own business and restaurant. So these ladies, you know, you never know who's got all the talent that God gave them. They might not. These singers or entertainers, but they, everybody's got something God has given them yeah. that they're good at. They just right. refuse to make it public, so most people, because of, they might fail so they don't try. So, yeah, people that can't do what you do, you ought to do it so they'll enjoy it, right? Yeah. And, uh, but guess what? Lowe's is closed today. I'm trying to get there. I, on the door said, closed Easter Sunday. So God has to bring judgment on the land <laughs> to shut Walmart down from 24-7 and Lowe's from 20, you know, all these. So we're seeing signs. So guess what? All those lilies I saw are sitting there and nobody's buying them today. And uh, they should have discounted them and I would have showered you with Easter lilies. Now. <laughs> but our extra money has gone to utilities and furnaces have broken down thousands of dollars, uh, natural gas is still $6 a unit when it should be two and a half dollars a unit. And so our Easter gifts have been going towards getting through the winter and plowing into the spring and summer. So uh, it's been a long, hard winter because it's a, it's a woman, it's a woman winter. It's called La Nina. It's been there over two years and maybe back again next year. It brings drought in the summer and it brings long, violent winters, okay? So it doesn't look like it's going anywhere. Uh, they hope it'll be over this year, but it's not. So when El Nino shows up, the man, then things are, uh, there. they go the different, different, well, shorter winters and uh, just, but you know, that's the Spanish. It is something, but because all the illegal aliens have come across, now they've brought La Nina with them and El Nino with them. Remember, we never, we never talked in Spanish about the weather. <laughs> Am I imagining this? Let's stand and read these 10 verses here. Luke 24. The good news here. 
It says, Now upon the first day of the week, very early, very early in the morning, they had a, a sunrise service this morning down at the university, as they do each year. Very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. So this is more than one person. They found the stone rolled away with, from the sepulchre or the grave. And they entered in, they, notice the plurality here, and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. It came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabout, they again. Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, notice the they and them all through the story. Why seek ye the living among the dead? Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, quote here, the Son of Man must, 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 must be delivered into the hands of sinner, sinful men, be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words, they, and returned from the sepulchre and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. Now who was the they? Well, as usual, it's the ladies. It's the girls that, yeah, women need more respect I mean, it wouldn't be a next generation human race without the ladies. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. So, Lord, we thank you for the resurrection and thank you for those that accompanied the resurrection Amen. and spread the word of the resurrection so that we hear over 2,000 years later, are still uh, honoring their work, what they did, yes. and uh, following what Jesus told them to do, to go Amen. to all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. And it's amazing that we stand here today, be with the backslidden Christians that really are saved and may be ashamed of not doing what God has said through His Son and by the Holy Ghost. We pray for your blessings now on this new day and new week in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Be seated if you would. Now, uh, the uh, phrase there, why seek ye the living among the dead, that, that is a good title. And think about this. Are you the living among the dead? Or are you the dead among the living? That's, that's a, there's that choice of belief and unbelief. Yeah. So if you're saved, we are living among the dead. Yeah. And if you're not saved, then you are dead living among the living, those that have been born again. That will live. Either you'll live forever or you will die forever. That's right. the, uh, notice it's just no halfway house there. It's just this or that or that, or this. It is the choice of eternity. So we have here that the uh, resurrection, and you know this, uh, has lost its importance in society. They call it spring break now in schools for years. Just make sure you don't mention God or Jesus or any of these things. You know, just neutralize uh, the power of the gospel. And isn't it strange, but in most countries, you can put gospel literature in all the mailboxes in Europe, when the Czech Republic, when you were a missionary there. And uh, in, in Canada, you can go door to door, put them in the mailbox, free of charge. You can load up. Well, not in the USA. It's against the federal law. We've had the post office contact us more than once because we had some zealous members that went and put them in mailboxes and they called me and said we've uh, got your literature here and we had one of the hospitals uh, said they'd call security because somebody got zealous and went through all the hospital and put literature and that's private property of course 
And but the post office says now this is a warning because we have hundreds of mailboxes that have your literature in there. And uh, each one of those, if we want to, will cost you $600 a piece. And so I had to get in touch with who I knew did it because of their zealousness for the Lord. But in a strange in a land that used to claim to be a Christian nation, that everybody on earth can do that, but not America. Yeah. And why? Separation of church and state. Well, yeah, but freedom of speech is still the First Amendment of our nation, free speech. So anyway, we have lost the resurrection importance in society. And uh, look at 2 Timothy 4 real quick before we move on. 2 Timothy 4, uh, Paul talked about this was going to be the norm. And uh, Springfield's a different kind of church town. When I came here in 87, 88, the survey of congregations uh, in Springfield was in Greene County was 240, right? In 88, they did a newspaper survey of active congregations of Christian churches or worship centers, they call them. <coughs> well, in 2014, they did another one, 25 or so years later. And in Greene County, the last survey was uh, 400 churches in the same county. So super saturated this one county, and there's probably more now. So Springfield has this glut of gospel. How many, how many know that if you eat too much of anything, it'll make you sick? We think all the churches, we should have heaven on earth in Springfield. We still have murders and thefts and child. One of the highest rates of child abuse in America is in Springfield, Missouri. Some of you know that. Some of you don't know that, but you know it now. But he said it would be... Uh, Terrible time. Look at 2 Timothy 4, verse 3 to 5. For the time will come, he says to Timothy, in the last days, uh, and the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine or teachings of Jesus. Sound doctrine, they will not put up with it. But after their own, what? Lust. Lust. So that's, that's the war right now in churches especially in America, they have substituted spirituality for sensuality. It's all about feelings now, not about faith and facts, meaning the Bible. They will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts, what makes me feel good, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Well, why don't they scratch your ears, you might say. No, he's talking about popularity. On Christian radio, we have top-notch speakers. On television, we have top-notch speakers. And isn't it something, but when they get on the air, they can only say but so much truth, or they will not get a spot on the air. They have to draw a crowd through their popularity and their viewership or their listenership and uh, when you listen to Christian radio, you are listening to those paying the top money, or they have, after they get so many listen, listeners, then the radio station has to pay them to come on because they draw so much attention. Been around this for a good while. And uh, so after their own teachers having itching ears, it's not so much they tickle your ears, but they, they kind of like to hear it themselves how the top 10, the top 20, the top 1,000. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Fables. Hmm. Today is, what is today called? What is it called? It's called Easter. That's, that is not a Christian term. Okay found in the book of Acts, but it's, it's for Astarte, which was a false goddess. It, but every year, it's like the Passover, it was just the other day, and uh, the Jewish. So we, we have adopted this term. Well, who is the main figure of Easter? 
They're mad because it rained today. Because they couldn't have their Easter egg hunt on the lawns of the churches, and some of them decorated down the road here. Well, you know what I'm saying? It shall be turned to fables. It's a slow boiling of the frog thing. It's cute. It's, you know, but let me tell you, see that cross back there? That's our symbol, not a bunny rabbit. Right. And then Thanksgiving Day is Turkey Day or Football Day or uh, Christmas is not Christ's birth. It is the guy that flies around overweight yeah. around the world in 24 hours and everybody loves him and uh, complained to their parents because he didn't bring them what they wanted. So he's talking about people will believe anything except the doctrines of the Bible. And so we wonder why isn't America being blessed and we're only $31 trillion in national debt now. Ronald Reagan came in, guess what? We had $2 trillion of national debt. And now it's 31 and climbing of national debt. It means the government doesn't know how to run a business called the United States. So then go quickly to, uh, in uh, Ephesians 2, 1 real quick, back up on the left, and we see here Ephesians 2 and verse 1, talks about the resurrection, our own resurrection, and you have the quickened, what does the word quickened mean? Made He's made alive, right? And you have the quickened, Ephesians 2, 1, who were dead in trespasses and sins. So, how many are glad you're saved? Amen. Yeah, we were dead in sins, and now we're alive in Christ. Lastly, look here, if you would, to Colossians chapter 2, Colossians 2, 12 to 15. He tells the church of Colossae here also, 2 verse 12, he talks about this, the symbolism of baptism and what's really taking place uh, in our salvation. Buried with him in baptism, so it shows the death of Christ when we are baptized. Uh, also you are what risen with him when you come out of the water it's a picture of the resurrection risen with him through the faith of the operation of God so we go down in the water we come up but we are, we're saved through the operation of God not getting wet whether it's spitting, pouring, sprinkling or immersion and uh, it is an operation of God who hath raised him from the dead, raised Christ, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened, made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his, what? to his cross and having spoiled principalities and powers he made a show of them openly triumphing excuse me triumphing I can say it over them in it and so we we are saved by the operation of God not by any works that we can do and we just simply show forth after salvation the death and the uh, Christ and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. That is the symbolism of baptism. But we're saved through the operation of God, not the operation of man. Well, this is an old story of the resurrection. Go to Job 19, 25, and we'll stay there and uh, see the oldest uh, doctrinal teaching on the resurrection uh, thousands of years later. This was written around 3,500 plus years ago. This Job is not the book, first book in our Bible, but it is the first book ever written in the Bible, or to be part of the Bible, was the 42 chapters of Job. And it's something that, that would be the very first, you might say, example for us to go through hard times, there's a devil in there, there's God in there, there's friends, there's enemies, and and we have 
strength here in chapter 19. Now, uh, Job 19, we're going to study verse 25 to 20, uh, 27 in a minute. But the, the uh, chapter 19 starts out here with Job's friends acting as Job's enemies. They're henpecking him to death. That's why Jesus said, judge not that you be not judged, right? And uh, teaches a lot on us being the judge, jury, and executioner of other people's sins. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Look at verse 1. Then Job answered and said to his so-called three friends, How long will you vex my soul and break me in pieces with words? These, how many? Ten times have you reproached me. You're not ashamed that you make yourselves strange unto me here, unto me. He said, you're breaking our friendship. You're, you're, you're eating me up and spitting me out. And so this is the story here that he's taking this. It's bad enough that the devil did this, but then the devil tries to use people so very close to us to, to bury us, as it were, and to estrange us. Now look at verse 21 to 24 as we enter into what Job's about to say about the resurrection. So he tells them, and if you read the rest, it's, it's really interesting, but in 21 to 24, he just says here, Have pity upon me, have pity upon me, O ye my friends. For the hand of God hath touched me. <coughs> so he sees, <coughs> he sees God in his troubles. Why do you persecute me as God? And are not satisfied with my flesh. Notice he's got the boils. Can't you see how much I'm suffering? And yet you're piling on. As, as if you're not satisfied with my punishment, which you say I've caused. And here's a good one. How many are reading your Bible right now? Look what he says 3,500 years ago. Oh, that my words were now what? Written. Had no idea that 3,500 plus years ago we would be sitting here studying his entire life. How does, uh, how does that happen by accident? How did he pull this off? How, how can you guarantee somebody will read about you 4,000 years from now if there is anything left? Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. Amen. Here it is. God heard that prayer. He didn't even know it was a prayer that they were graven or carved with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. Well, here it is. You explain that one. And you, you can take any version of the Bible and this, this statement will still be in there. It, it's not going anywhere. It's there. It is graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. So now he starts his happy dance here from 25 to 27. So these are Job's statements about the resurrection. Now first we see verse 25, Job's surety. Just how sure he is about his future. 25, he says here, for I blank. For I know. That's surety, isn't it? I, I know this. He's talking about his eternal future. He, this is his surety that he has. For I know. You know when you got saved, did you know you were saved? Did you know something didn't happen to me? You couldn't explain it, but you know the peace that passes all understanding and the weight of sin and judgment was gone. Man, you know, Jack Proctor, I led with the Lord, my childhood best friend. He's uh, not in good shape right now in South Carolina. His wife just died, but 
when when I led him to the Lord by the, the old couch in Virginia, he got up and late at night and he said, "Man, I feel I feel so light." I said, "It's called the burden of sin is gone." And he pulled his marbles out. He said, "What do I do with these now?" First thing, <laughs> I said, "Well." I showed him a verse, your body is now the temple of the Holy Ghost, you know. I said, uh, God's going to take them away from you. He wants you to live, not to die. Yeah. And God gives us stuff that keeps us alive. The devil gives us stuff that takes away our life. Uh, yes. Alcohol, tobacco, and lottery tickets. <laughs> <laughs> or gambling, yeah. Well, anyway, Jack just took them and he said, well, if they got to go, they got to go. And he threw them across the room and landed them in the trash can. I told him about that a few weeks ago, and he said, man, I remember that just like it just happened. He said, man, we've been saved almost 50 years now. I said, that's right. Job's surety. Now look, secondly, Job's savior. What does he know? What does he know? For I know, and he goes on in the second part there, for I know that the savior, my what? My redeemer liveth. And he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. So Job has a surety of his eternal life. And he has the Savior called his Redeemer. I know that my Redeemer. It goes back to the first prophecy of Genesis 3.15. About the seed of the woman. And the, and the serpent. And the death, you know, Satan and the cross. That's what the, uh, Genesis 3.15 is the first picture of. Of salvation and so we have Job's surety there in 25 and then we also have Job's Savior in 25 now thirdly look at verse 26 we have Job's security in verse 26 all of the verse his security and though after my skin worms destroy this body Yet in my flesh shall I see God. He's, I'm going to see him. I'm going to be with him. I, I'm going to shed this old tent. Worms can have it. And they always do. And But I have a surety, a security here. Now, some don't like the term eternal security. But what about the word eternal assurance? I had an insurance man when I first got saved came by our little country house. And uh, he came to sell me some insurance. He was a Catholic fellow. And uh, I asked him, I said, well, assurance. He said, yeah, this is, uh, I mean, this is insurance. I said, well, do you have an assurance plan? Because I was full of the zeal of the Lord. He said, an assurance plan. I said, yeah, I, uh, Insurance is okay, but do you have a policy of assurance? He said, what, what is that? Can you sell me a policy that will assure that I will go to heaven when I die? He looked at me. He said, I've never heard of a product like that. I said, well, yeah, it's right in the Bible here on the coffee table. Want me to show it to you? He, he looked at his watch. He said, oh, you know, I'm, I have another appointment coming up. And man, he got... As they say, he got as nervous as a, a cat on a sharp picket fence, yeah. When Paul said, walk circumspectly, one old preacher, I remember in a service, he said, yeah, walking circumspectly is a, is a cat walking on the top of a sharp picket fence, circumspectly. That's, that's a good example. But that guy, he packed up and out of the, and I never did buy his insurance, and he never did learn assurance. But I had it. I'd just been saved recently. So Job here has the security. He has assurance that he will live eternally. And so we have the surety of his, his uh, teaching of the resurrection. We have the savior of the resurrection. We have the security. How many think you're going to heaven? Amen. How many know you're going to heaven? That's the problem there, and especially in Springfield, because of all the isms that float around here. And then number four, verse 27, lastly, 
we have not only this surety, he knows what I'm talking about. The Savior, he knows who he is. The security, I'm saved forever. And then Job's satisfaction says here, in uh, whom I shall, his satisfaction is, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. There was nothing left of me. I'm satisfied with my salvation. I know God is satisfied with my decision. And he, he's, he's just so happy to think about the future. Everybody's nipping at his heels and he's got disease and his wife says, curse God and die because she did buy the insurance policy. And uh, it's a proof of that was life insurance back then. I studied that in the Hebrew now. You just don't know. But as we finish up here, his surety, his savior, his security, and his satisfaction that he's done all he can do to live forever. And if you've received Christ and you've been born again, you've done all you can do to live forever. You ain't going to just lose it or walk off of it. It, it. You're either born again and you have what he had or you ain't got it yet. You cannot add to it. You cannot take away from it. That's the reason we're going to heaven. Belief in the work of Calvary. Amen. I have one sermon with 28 things to consider about the resurrection, but just a few questions here as we conclude. So, years ago I wrote, if there is no resurrection then can you explain these things? If there is no resurrection, can you explain these things? <clears throat> can you explain the unfound corpse of Jesus Christ? Well, guess what? The unfound corpse. Where's Bin Laden at? They can't find his corpse. Does that make him God? No. They can't find Jimmy Hoffa. Remember the, the criminal uh, disappeared union leader? Yeah. Well, let's go on. They can't find them. Can you explain the unknown tomb of the unfound corpse? Uh, can you explain the untried thieves who moved the body? Can you explain, number four, the unpunished guards that knew they would die if he was taken? Can you explain the unflinching courage of his disciples for these last 2,000 plus years? The unflinching courage. Now, Bin Laden, we have video that shows him being killed. Right, we do. And we have the man who killed him. They dumped his body at sea so they couldn't turn it into a memorial like Stalin and Lenin and whatever. But they fully know where that corpse is through sonar and they've recorded that. It's on the bottom of the ocean and uh, it's not like, oh, he, he rose from the dead. No, they, he's still down there. And Jimmy Hoffa, if you offered enough money they would tell you where his, his uh, body is. Some say it's buried in concrete in a 55-gallon drum uh, under the earth up near Chicago. But where is, the, where is Jesus at? Explain that. They had 2,000 plus years to come up with something. Amen. So how do you, the unflinching courage, how do you explain the unveiling of the New Testament? The unveiling of it to take and override the Old Testament these last 2,000 years without people being forced to do it. The New Testament is the marching orders of Jesus Christ, empowered by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So how do you <coughs> explain the undermining of the symbol of the cross? See, the original cross symbol is Life to death. It's an execution symbol. But after the 
resurrection, it became death unto life symbol. We wear it around our necks in jewelry. We don't advertise death. We advertise life. And even the heathen that don't even know this wear it because it's become pretty popular. But the cross is our official Christian symbol. And Jesus don't hang on it either. And you know, there's a lot of places that he's still strung up on the cross. And, and because you, you say they ain't paid for in those churches. But the vacant cross. How do you explain the symbolism changing? Except through the resurrection. The power of the resurrection. How about the undoing of the Sabbath day? How do you explain going from the last day of the week Saturday to the first day of the week and it's also called the eighth day because they met the second time it was on a Sunday Pentecost day was on a, was on a uh, Sunday and uh, now upon the first day of the week bring all the tithes and offerings it talks about in Corinthians first day of the week how do you, how do you explain that Sunday overriding Saturday without forcing people to do that it's just naturally, and uh, we go back to the Old Testament, you'll see all the, the Jubilee, 49 years plus one, <coughs> brings you to a Sunday. It's amazing. Pentecost is 49 days plus one, which brings you to a Sunday, the day of Pentecost. And so it's a picture of showing it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, and it's here, it's been here 2,000 years, and you say there is no resurrection. Well, Start explaining all these things here. And then uh, <clears throat> we also have the unusual change in every believer's life and lifestyle that follows him. How do you explain that? And we've never shook hands with Jesus Christ, or we've never been in a meeting with his physical appearance. And yet we do what he says? Is that peer pressure, or is it the Holy Spirit really is in me. And I do this because I love somebody I've never seen. Somebody I will be with for eternity. How do you explain that? And uh, number nine, let's see. <coughs> How about explaining the unlimited supply of important people all around the world how to explain the unlimited supply of important people throughout history that believe in the resurrected Christ of Jesus. Yeah. Presidents and, and kings and nobles and Napoleon and all these people, their, their historical testimonies of Christ in their life. How do you, I mean, they, they could have lost their offices, they could have lost their wealth, they could have lost everything. Even the founders of our nation lost most of their wealth over freedom from the Bible, wanting a nation that practiced the Bible. Number 11, lastly, I wrote a little while ago, thinking it through. How do you explain the unused title, The Late Jesus Christ? <laughs> Nobody ever says, The Late Jesus Christ. They, they may say, The Late Winston Churchill, or the late George Washington or the late uh, Aunt Gracie, but nobody ever uses the term of Jesus as he's dead. He is alive. Amen. And that's why we're here today. That's why we're here every Sunday and more because of a living Christ. Amen. He did what he said he would do and he's never lied yet. Amen. So the question is, are you the living among the dead or are you still the dead among the living, among God's people? And dear Lord, we thank you for saving our souls and helping us get to church today. And we know the special meaning of this day. We would ask you to use us to be those witnesses that those, those ladies at the tomb, uh, Lord, they ran out and they started telling people about Jesus rising from the dead. And so we would ask you to keep us zealous for the gospel's sake and help us, like Job, even though people might pick us to death and try to stop us, 
Help us to just remember our future is secure. It's eternal. It's not going anywhere. Come boils and come uh, threats, come shame. Let us just do the, do the jobs in our heart. So give us more money, more time, more health, and more opportunities to preach the gospel to every creature. Bless our missionaries around the world that are risking everything as we sit here this morning. Keep us zealous for the Lord. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Let's all stand and turn to page 290. Thank you, Lord, for saving me, an old, old sinner. Thank you so much. The resurrection of our Lord. Page 290. Lift it up. Oh,